So today I have the pleasure to uh, introduce uh, our first session. Our first session is going to focus uh, primarily on literary creativity. In fact, the whole morning is really devoted to literary creativity. And our first speaker is the Canadian poet Robert Greenhurst. Now, Robert Greenhurst kind of came across my radar uh, rather late in my life, just actually a few months ago. But I, I've been wondering ever since, you know, where has he been all of my life? Um, the reason I started reading him was because recently my mentor, Ron Scollin, died of renal cancer. And one of the last things he said to me uh, before he died was, you got to get to know this guy. And I'm of the belief that um, when somebody says something to you on his deathbed, you ought to do it. So um, there's a little bit of selfishness, I think, in my inviting Robert here today, um, because I thought that maybe by inviting him, a little bit of Robert would be here as well. Uh, Robert's not just a um, poet. Uh, he's also an architect, a physicist, um, a literary critic, and a topographer. And uh, one of his books that I just finished was The Elements of Typographic um, Style. I never thought that I would ever read a book called The Elements of Typographic Style, or I, that I would ever say, this book is a real page turner. And it's a very, very interesting book. So beautifully written, so many interesting insights into uh, the aesthetics of fonts and writing systems that I think now I'll never read a book the same way again. I'm going to embarrass Robert a little bit by um, reading something that was said about him by the novelist Jim Harrison, who said, occasionally, but rarely in my lifetime, I have come across a critical intelligence whom I can fairly describe by the word genius. George Steiner, Roberto Calasso, and Walter Benjamin come easily to mind, among a few others. And now I must add Robert Greenhurst, who has set my old mind off in an altogether pleasant world. Now I'll read something that Robert says about himself. He says, I've been listening to the world for barely half a century. I do not have the wisdom even of a young tree of an ordinary kind. Nevertheless, I have been listening with eyes, ears, mind, feet, fingertips. And what I hear is poetry. Please welcome Robert Greenhouse.
in any significant sense of the word. Creativity, an idea that once needed no name because it was thought to belong to the gods or to God alone, became a human word when humans came to see themselves as godlike. Ecologists take the view that the whole, all creation, as many people call it, is inherently more valuable, more beautiful, and incidentally a good deal wiser than any of its constituent parts or species. They also perceive, as an elementary fact of life, that no species can survive independently of the whole, and that every species therefore needs to keep the interests of the whole close to its heart. Those who are generally known as deep ecologists also take the view that no species, including our own, is remotely competent to manage or redesign the whole, and that campaigns to achieve this end are accordingly more destructive than creative. The school of thought and political action known as deep ecology traces its lineage primarily to the Norwegian philosopher and mountaineer Arne Ness, who died last January at the age of 96. Ness began as a language philosopher, a student of Rudolf Carnap and the Vienna Circle. That is to say, in early life, he took the view that cutting human language down to size was philosophy's highest task. Over the course of a long life, he traveled a long way from that persuasion. It was here in Hong Kong in 1973, when he was 50 years of age, that Ness first outlined an essentially ecological philosophy. Ness preferred to call it ecosophy, and his Hong Kong lecture, delivered here 36 years ago, was entitled Introduction to Ecosophy. The road from the analytical Ness to the ecosophical Ness was long and fairly circuitous. It had something to do with his mountaineering expeditions to the Himalayas and his consequent encounter with Sherpa culture and Tibetan Buddhism. It had something to do with his experience during the German occupation of Norway in the Second World War. And it had something to do with his detailed study of the life and work of Mohandas Gandhi. But Ness was prepared for these experiences in a way that already set him apart from other thinkers. I do not know of any other post-Socratic philosopher who spent such prodigious amounts of time outdoors in non-human company, or who had anything like Ness's first-hand knowledge of natural history. It was fashionable for quite some time in Europe, Asia, and the Americas to divide the world into advanced cultures and primitive ones. When the absurdity of that terminology grew too obvious and blatant to ignore, the labels started to change, and people began to speak of modern cultures and traditional ones, or of open cultures and closed ones. Traditional cultures were perceived to be hereditary structures that strive not to change, and accordingly do change only when pushed, while modern cultures were supposed to be self-conscious, self-made, self-propelled. The very notion of creativity, and the word itself, appears to be connected to this cultural perspective. The verb to create and its noun creation go back to the foundations of Indo-European speech. The descriptive adjective creative was unknown in English until coined by the Reverend Dr. Ralph Cudworth in a large book called The True Intellectual System of the Universe, published in London in 1678. Even then, Cudworth used the term only in relation to the divine. Not until the early 19th century did Wordsworth speak of creative art as something practiced by humans. It was around that time, incidentally, that the peculiar Americanism, creative writing, was born. There were no programs or degrees in creative writing before the mid-20th century, but in 1837, the young Ralph Waldo Emerson could already take the praise for granted. In that year, he informed an audience at Harvard that, quote, there is then a creative reading as well as a creative writing. When the mind is braced by labor and invention, the page of whatever book we read becomes luminous with manifold illusion. Every sentence is doubly significant, and the sense of our author is as broad as the world." End quote. 